And now I'd like to introduce you to Bruce Lubenstein, who is a professor here at Cornell in Science and Technology and Communication. And if I ever have a question of how I talk to people or how I best tell my stories, this is one of the people I call. So, Bruce. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so for those who don't know, the Department of Science and Technology Studies is where history and politics and sociology and anthropology of science are done. And I'm really grateful for the Carl Sagan Institute for including those kinds of topics um, in, the, uh, in what the Carl Sagan Institute does. Um, this is my typical opening slide. I did modify it a little bit today to add that in addition to being in the USA, the USA itself is located on Earth, in the solar system, in the solar neighborhood, in the Orion arm, in the Milky Way galaxy, which is in the local group of galaxies, the Virgo supercluster in the universe. And that comes from Robin Hurst's book, My Place in Space. If you don't know that book, I strongly recommend it. My grandchildren will be getting copies of it at Thanksgiving. Um, for me, Carl Sagan um, and other science communicators like him are my objects of study. I'm interested in understanding what they do um, and helping others, as Lisa said, um, do it themselves in the future. So my connection to Carl Sagan, I graduated from college in the summer of, early summer of 1980. And my first job was as a science writer working on a series of books about the human body. Our first book was The Brain. And as it happened, just a year earlier, Carl Sagan had published Broca's Brain. Uh, and this was therefore one of the things we turned to. I was a researcher for the book. One of the things we turned to to find out, well, what's going on? What is, what is current knowledge? Um, and of course, that meant that, oh, there's broke his brain. Um, and of course, that meant then that in the fall, as I started work in the fall of 1980, we were watching Cosmos uh, as it came out. I will admit, I didn't see a lot of it that in that initial um, uh, release, in part because I was living, I was newly graduated, I was living in a group house with a lot of other recent graduates, and let's say access to television was not the highest priority uh, in that in that place. But let's jump ahead to, to the kind of work that I do. So we jump ahead about 30 years, and I was working on a project about the history of science books in the years after World War II. It's a period when we think of science as taking place in journals, and the question is, what role did books play? I won't go through the whole project, but I, I noticed an interesting set. There were three books that had movie or TV shows associated with them, three bestsellers, three you know, sort of very prominent books that had um, video associated with them. Jacques Cousteau's Silent World, the book came out in 1953, the movie came out in 1956, directed by Louis Maul. The movie is amazing. Uh, the, despite more than 50 years of technical development since then, the visual quality continues to grab me every time I look at the video. It's just an amazing movie, the quality. Bernowski's Ascent of Man appeared in the UK in 1973 as a response to Sir Kenneth Clark's late 1960s series called Civilization, which somehow managed to leave science out of civilization. Um, and Bernowski's goal was to put science back into our understanding of what civilization is. The series was imported to the U.S. in 1974. And Ascent of Man has a direct connection to Cosmos because they were both produced by Adrian Malone, the first one at the BBC, and then after he uh, was forced to leave the BBC because of disagreements with them uh, here in the U.S. Uh, working with PBS. That's a different story. I won't tell it. Um, we've heard so much, and we heard the wonderful quote from Kavi Dabala about the inspiration that Cosmos provided. One of my standard 
tools in classes and when I talk to scientists is to ask them what inspired them to become scientists. And when I talk to people of a certain generation, my parents' generation, let's say, they tell me they read Paul de Cruyff's book, Microbe Hunters, published in the 1920s. I talk to a later generation, they read Jim Watson's book, Double Helix, published in the 1960s. I see some heads nodding here. When I ask the next generation, they tell me they watched Cosmos, that that's what inspired them uh, to become scientists. So what did I notice about these three books? What struck me about them was that they each treated the idea of imagination differently. As presented in broader culture, science is about facts and ideas, not about imagination. And yet, as these two epigraphs suggest, there's an interesting reversal when we think about imagination. With the scientist, the prototypical scientist, Albert Einstein, says that imagination is more important than knowledge. And yet the poet, Wallace Stevens, says, eventually an imaginary world is entirely without interest. So I saw that in the three shows as well. In the interest of time, I'll skip over Cousteau and Bronowski in detail, just to say that Cousteau was anti-imagination. Truth was central to him. He, at one point, he filmed a fake skeleton in a, in a, in a, a shipwreck. Then he said, quote, but we did not use the sequence. It was fake. I have no untruths in my pictures. And he sighed when he tried to describe what it was like to be a scuba diver. I cannot tell you how much better than the imagination it is downstairs. That's how he referred to going underwater. Bernowski wasn't as anti as Cousteau, but imagination was only part of the whole. He was more interested in the rational and the emotional. In, uh, to, in adding the cultural component. In the famous opening scene to Ascent of Man, he says his imagination, his reason, his emotional stability and toughness make it possible for him not to accept the environment, but to change it. And that series of, in, of inventions by which man from age to age has remade his environment is a different kind of evolution not biological, but cultural evolution. And I call that re brilliant sequence of cultural peaks the ascent of man, Just leaving aside the, the gendered aspect of his, <laughs> time, of his time. And of course, that brings us to Carl Sagan. In Cosmos, imagination is central. It's fundamental. One of the most memorable parts of it is the ship of the imagination. It was the let place that let you explore the cosmos. Now, I do have to acknowledge that critics of the show found the setup a little bit cheesy. Um, the version in Neil deGrasse Tyson's reboot was perhaps a bit more acceptable as a sort of um, future. But this was still an amazing technical achievement at the time. Truth and fidelity were critical to Sagan's vision of cosmos, just as it was for Cousteau and Bernowski. Once, according to one of his biographies, in the middle of a take, Sagan and co-writer and planetary scientist Steve Soder stepped in to, stopped, they stopped the, the process because they needed to calculate, literally on the back of an envelope, the amount of oxygen in a planetary moon's atmosphere. Sagan was absolutely committed to getting the science right, recalled one of the show's other uh, producers, Jeff Haynes Styles. Nonetheless, imagination was central to Sagan's vision. There was this blend of fact and speculation. Again, the famous opening sequence, we wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads, but to find the truth, we need imagination and skepticism both. We will not be afraid to speculate, but we will be careful to distinguish speculation from fact. So, Imagination, as well as fidelity, was a key idea in Cosmos. Notably, the fidelity is to science. Although there is culture in Sagan's Cosmos, the series is about the science itself. And for that science, you needed imagination. There was, of course, a straightforward level of imagination coming, coming up with the 
amazing explanations and illustrations and animations and so forth to see things that we hadn't seen before. But ultimately, those explanations were not the important thing. There's a different level of imagination that's fundamental here. Sagan said, I would be very pleased if viewers left the entire Cosmos series without remembering a single fact, provided that they found rekindled some of that ancient human joy in understanding the natural world in the celebration of nature. So for Carl Sagan, imagination is key both to Cosmos, the show, and to the Cosmos in which we live. Thank you very much.